County Line. If you've been following me this summer, and I hope you have, you'll know that I've strayed away from the County Line, ventured into the country because I've been looking for some major dudes. Um, Steely Dan set me on this course back in 1973 when he came out with a song by the name Any Major Dude Will Tell Ya. I've listened to it millions of times. I don't understand what the major dudes have to say or even who they are. So I felt compelled to try and find some of my own. And my definition has been from the very start of this project that they had to be smart. Uh, they had to have enough life experience that they could develop a philosophy of success and they had to be able to articulate how they became successful. And it's been my pleasure the last six or seven years to uh, know some amazing women who fit all those qualifications. And I've been trying since January to get them to sit down for a podcast <laughs> with me and they've been busy because they've got other responsibilities. But with me today is Kelly, the blonde, if you're watching, and Jamie, he looks like every Irish movie star you ever saw. So, thanks, ladies. You're I welcome. Appreciate thanks you being for asking here. us. Yes. I know. My pleasure. And since you're so articulate, I guess we should start off with a question that people have been asking since Adam and Eve. Oh, boy. What do women want? <laughs> what do women want? Um, I think stability, love, respect, good communication. How do you get those things? How do you attain those things? You Do you feel like you've reached those goals? I think I, you have to work on it every day, but yeah, I mean. I think I've been given those things and I've um, been blessed with those things as well from when I was little to now. Um, I mean, and I guess not everybody grows up feeling loved, but that's not something that I've ever not felt, so. You knew love growing up, so yeah. you expected love when you had your own family? Yeah, I would say that. Is that pretty much your situation, Yeah, for Kelly? sure, yeah, yeah. I had just actually shared my testimony on a pilgrimage we just went on, and I felt like extreme amounts of love when I was a little kid. It turns out that my mom had six miscarriages between my sister and I. So I realized that that's probably why everybody doted on me and loved me so much because I was a little bit of a miracle. So I really, really, really felt loved. Oh, you like, were the entire... special <laughs> yes. little extra baby. That, yeah. uh, so I felt very special the rest of Spoiled. my life. Spoiled. Did your sisters resent you then? No, I just have one older sister, and I she wanted a baby sister so badly that... Okay, that yeah. worked out well. Yes. So exactly. then, with these goals in mind, you guys eventually got married. And how many times have you been divorced, collectively? Zero. Really? Zero. Both of you? Yeah. Never? Never. Okay. Do you have any tattoos? No tattoos. No tattoos. All right. Well, I think that might have been a deal breaker if I had one. I don't know. So... Well, how do you... <laughs> This, this business of love and stability that you talk about in your lives, which brings you a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. How do you, and you've been blessed with it, you said, Jamie. You yeah. You don't think it's something you actually earned. You were given it. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I had a loving family growing up. And I, I mean, in some ways, love breeds love. So I receive love, I give love. And I, so I, you can see that throughout you just kind of nurtured what you were given mm -hmm. and been able to hold on to it that way. Yeah. What's involved in that? How do you nurture love? How do you nurture love? I think that it's you give of yourself in some ways. Um, but, and it's balanced because you're not just taking, you have to give as well. So I think that's a lot of it too. You can't just expect everybody to do everything for you to fill your cup. So you have to fill a little bit of yourself, fill it up a little bit of yourself, but then by doing that for other people as well. Sacrificing, you know, I mean, I think it's a balance, but yeah. you know, when you sacrifice for somebody else and they sacrifice for you, you know what that feels like. And I think one of the key parts too, for both of us, our story is God's always been a big part of both families. So um, when you know that love of Christ, 
I think that is also what leads you to love others because you feel so loved. That's interesting. What's God got to do with it? Well, God is love. Tell me, tell me how that works. <laughs> he tells us he is love. Yeah, his, yeah. his every being is love. So, I mean, we're created from the love that he has for us. Well, that makes sense, but um, what would you say to someone who might suggest that they could they could love someone without God's influence? I would tell them to try it and see what happens. I think you have to have God in your life, and I, I really feel that if you don't, that's when things happen that are not maybe the successful, the the happy endings and things like that, you ultimately, you need to have God. I think it also starts with what is the definition of love, right? Love is wanting what is best for the person's soul. Um, and I think sometimes that gets lost. People don't really know what love actually means. That's why I'm asking you. Right. So, <laughs> so you look. So to, once you know what love actually means, then you can work up from that point on. And, and and by looking to God for a definition, you're able to direct your life and along whatever you think He right. may have wanted of you. <clears throat> sure. I mean, I think yeah. If you're if you're looking, if I say I love you. You know, that, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but true love is wanting what's best for your soul. So am I gonna, how am I going to treat you that's best for your soul? From a dating standpoint, all the way up. To your children. Yep. And on. Well, you know, there's a lot of challenges for families these days. It's, I think probably more so than any time in history. Uh, and... The Depression, for example, drew people closer to Christ because they were desperate. But we have so much in our country right now, so many excesses, that people just feel like they don't need God to love. and Which is probably why they're still searching. What are the, what and, are the consequences? And using drugs and using, you know, you keep... You keep Trying to find something else. St. Augustine has a great else. quote that says, My heart is restless until it rests in you. And it's totally true. You know, you, you will keep searching for that. Going through partners, going through jobs, going through whatever it is until you know that. And what happens when you come to know Christ? How does that affect these relationships and your behavior? Well, I mean, it's... It makes them more true. It makes them more meaningful. It makes them more real. Um. Okay, well, let's, you know, I was, we were talking before we started recording about um, a Gallup poll that Pastor Ed mentioned in his Kokomo Tribune column last Saturday where he said that it, the survey reported that 54% 50, of Americans favor abortion today, up from 40% in 2001, 22% believe that committing suicide is morally acceptable, up from 13% in 2001, 70% think smoking marijuana is okay, and 69% like having babies outside of wedlock. 43% are in favor of teenage sex, 66% gambling and 44 percent actually think that gender reassignment's a good idea how many 44 percent according to mm. this gallup poll wow there probably weren't any number no one was asking that question in 2001 i mean it was unthinkable yeah, it still that someone seems would very high change there yeah hmm. uh, but the same survey pastor ed reported revealed that four out of five U.S. adults say that the U.S. is experiencing a rapid decline in moral values. <laughs> so the people that answer that know that it's, right? That's kind of... I mean, that's what I, I gather from I, that. That's what I took from it, that they must know this is morally wrong. Which, but yet they still are okay with it. So, yeah, are morals really even important anymore? Well... If we don't want to keep declining. Well, isn't that kind of in the eye of the beholder? There's a term that I've seen 
recently called relativism. Which, ah. You know what that is? Yeah. It's what's good for me. Is If it's good for you, then you can do you. You do you. You do you. <laughs> How does that how does that meld with God's love? It doesn't. I mean, God wants us to be happy, <laughs> right? Of course he wants us to be happy. That's why he gave us rules to follow because he knew that that would lead us to true happiness. It's just like any family, right? If you, you truly if you're going to have rules, Boundaries. Have to, yeah, you have to have rules to follow. I mean, there's been tons and tons of books written about kids who have routines and know how what to expect and that they thrive better than people that are just allowed to do whatever they want. They do? Yeah. Do you think that we are reluctant to place boundaries on ourselves and other people now and that may be contributing to this sure, moral decline? Sure, because in the in interim it feels comfortable. It feels good. Which is why people to do To not it. feel controlled by something. Okay. Well, how does morality jive with uh, this this theory of relativism. It's like the opposite of morality. It kind of is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So what's the truth? <laughs> I mean, that, I, that's where my truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a relativism right there, I know, there, right? It? If, if that's what they would say, is that my me. truth might not be the same truth well, as somebody else. But you know, I mean, at, at, it's hard. To me, there's only one listening truth. To may not you know, have the same idea, but truth for us is Jesus Christ, right? And if he, truth speaks truly or nothing else is true. So for us, you know, what he says in the Bible, all this stuff is true because if you don't have a truth, then nothing else can follow. But if it doesn't make me happy to have these boundaries. In the moment, maybe it doesn't. But what we're saying is if you do have these boundaries and you do follow what Christ says, you, you will find happiness. Okay. That, I like that. I'm okay. not arguing <laughs> with you. Okay, I can, I can, I know you well enough to see that little <laughs> twinkle in your eye that you're about to just explode. Try it, right? I mean, I'm just yeah. saying, give it a whirl. How should we trust that? Why can we? Tr how can we trust? How can God? you not? You, well, I mean, if you we, have to try, right? If you don't do try, we? why shouldn't we try to well, be just I'm, happy? Because, why shouldn't we just adultery? Because are you happy? Yeah, I don't know. Are those people happy? Momentarily, otherwise they wouldn't keep searching for something else. So that's what you believe is happening here in with our culture. The search for happiness, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Does that work in your families too? How many kids do you guys got? <laughs> I know. I have four kids. I think that you my job as their parent is to do all that I can because ultimately I want them to go to heaven. And I believe that um, that's my job as their mom. So how does that look? Well, it's providing for them in all the ways possible so that that way they're given the tools to make that choice themselves. Eventually, I can't make them go there. I can't get them there on my own. But I can instill in them the, the moral rules, all the things that I've been taught through my relationship with Christ for them. Yeah. Has and they know that. No. Oh. And that's a conversation, like, if I ask them, they would respond, like, they know that my job is, it's not to be their friend, it's not, it's to do what I can to get them to heaven. Has that been your goal since they were born? Pretty much, yeah. And Not, and not our, college, and, not no. football and goal, scholarship. And it's the and goal for my husband. For, I was just going to say, and our goals for our husband. Yeah. That's, and our family, 16 yeah. families. And that's also the role that my husband has for me. It's doing what we can for each other so that we get each other to heaven. Again, the definition of love. Wanting what's best for the other person's soul. So it's the same and for sometimes disappointment so is good for that. You know, they're not always going to be happy with the decisions that are made for them as children. Um, but that's part of it. Yeah. That's growth. There's some non-negotiables. Yeah. Like church on Sunday. I mean, when we go on vacation, they go. Is that always easy? Does everybody always want to get up? early so they can go to mass that sort of stuff but it's an absolute non-negotiable yeah i mean and christ died for us and he suffered more than we can ever even imagine so what little suffering we have to have here on earth it only brings us closer to him mm -hmm. and to that relationship that we have with him how do you make people understand that though in a world where 
if you know if it's good for me it must be good for everybody I'm not hurt I'm not hurting anybody how many times do you hear that what are they hurting you by having gender reassignment and smoking a lot of dope and having an affair how's that I mean if it's not your spouse how's that what well, does that matter to you and maybe they aren't concerned about their soul I guess I, I don't know if they were concerned about their soul and they wanted their soul to be in heaven for all of eternity, then I think how they answered those questions would be different. So, when you and your husband married, how yes. many years ago? Um, 20, 20 years ago. Wow. Good. I can think Con about this. 22 yeah. for me. Congratulations uh, to both of you. That's yeah, awesome. Nice. And you did the, you know, the standing up, better, worse, put rings on each other's fingers, first yes. kiss and all that. Was it the first thing you thought about was, I got to get this guy to heaven? It was not my very first thought. No, probably not. I would say, you know, that's a growing part of our relationship with each other that we recognize within each other. I'm not saying I didn't want him to go to heaven, but probably in that day, in that moment, that's not what I was... I don't think that was probably the very first thing in my head. So but there's a, a lot. It's a, it's a lot that you've... day. Yeah, it's definitely something oh. that as a couple, we've grown to appreciate and want for each other more than we ever would have before. I mean, there are definitely things that we were, I think we've grown together in our relationship with Christ, individually and together. So I think that part comes the longer you're together, too. And for me, that part for me started before we even got to the altar. Um, just because that was, that's always been my goal once I understood what true love was for the people that I dated. That's how I based decisions off of. How old were you when you married? Um, 22, 23. Uh, and you already had a pretty clear idea about how you wanted to. Sure, yeah, for sure manage your relationship yep well i know you guys have both got some pretty interesting backstories about those very things and i want to dig into those a little bit um so the ladies are going to be back next week and for the rest of the month if you want to join us because <laughs> we've got a lot i got a lot of questions for them and i found them very interesting and entertaining so i hope you'll come back and join us and Ladies, thank you. God, yeah. God bless. <laughs>